This is our Bible. This is God speaking to us. Our eyes are open. Our heart is prepared to receive all of God's promises and instructions. Today we make our Bible the final authority in our life so that in every circumstance we will bear good fruit and others will see Christ in us. In Jesus' name, amen. Others will see Christ in us. In all circumstances, we will bear fruit. So that means even if you're going through a challenging time, people will still see Jesus in that trial. Amen? Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for your word. We thank you, Father God, for the sound. Uh, we thank you, Father God, for what you're doing. We ask, I ask, Father God, that the Holy Spirit would think through my mind and speak through my lips, that you would remove all of me, and that I would speak your word precisely and accurately. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah. Amen. Got my notes. All right, so if you have children that are in school, you probably know by now something about this new math. Because when you help them with homework, they still get it wrong if they don't get the answer the way they show them. I mean, seriously, two plus two will always be four. But for some reason, they get four a whole nother way. And they'll get it wrong if it's not done the new way. No joke, if you've got kids and they bring you homework, we tell Trinity all the time, that's above my grade level. They have changed the math. But that's just like God's math. And that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about the X factor because for us, we like to add. And when things don't add up, we subtract. And you should, if you do overspending, those principles are necessary. But when things don't add up, God multiplies. And he's been talking about multiplication for a long time. Sister Melinda said a few weeks ago, why settle for crumbs when God wants to give us a banquet? Right? Well, why settle for 4 plus 4 is 8 when God wants to give us 16? But we put ourselves in 4 plus 4. So let's turn to Genesis 128. I'm just going to show you a couple examples in the Old Testament, and then we're going to get to the nitty-gritty. And you know this was supposed to be a two-part message. Last week, we decided to follow the Holy Spirit and just go with prayer. So I got to do last week's and this week's message today. So follow me, okay? Amen. All right. Genesis 1, 28. Then God blessed them, speaking to um, Adam and Eve. God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and govern it. Reign over the fish and the sea, the birds in the sky, and all the animals that scurry around the ground. Then God tells Abraham that he will multiply his descendants in Genesis 22, 17. He says, I will certainly bless you. I will multiply your des descendants beyond number. Like the stars in the sky, the sand on the seashore, that sand that Ishmael was talking about, your, your de descendants will conquer the cities of their enemies. You know what's even more incredible about that multiplication with Abraham? Is that God did that in the late age. So if you think there's no hope because you're too old, you've messed up, I'm too far gone, let that be an encouragement to you that there's always time for God to do multiplication in your life. It's never too late. And God's not the only one in the multiplication business. So is Jesus, which we see in the New Testament. In Luke 18, I'm going to read it to you in the message, just two verses, Luke 18, 29 through 30. Yes, said Jesus, and you won't regret it. No one who has ever sacrificed a home, spouse, brothers, sisters, parents, children, whatever, will lose out. It will come back multiplied many times over in your lifetime and then the bonus of eternal life. Think about that. He says, no one who sacrificed a home, a spouse, brother, sister, parents, children, whatever. What does whatever mean? Whatever. Whatever you have sacrificed, it says, will not lose out. It will come back to you multiple times over in your lifetime. The bonus is heaven. Say bonus. bonus. Eternal, life. Eternal life. That's a bonus. That means that you will enjoy multiplication here and now, not when you get to heaven. 
That's kind of dreadful if to think I got to live this life with all this chaos going on in our world only to wait for this thing that happens when I get to heaven. That don't sound exciting to me. I mean, think about that. Why would God create us to live on this earth to go through torture just to wait to get to heaven to have some benefits? That's not the God we serve. So Jesus says, no one who has sacrificed. If you felt like your sacrifice has led you to lose a parent, a brother, a sister, a house, a job, a car, anything you felt connected to that you sacrificed for a greater good, you will have that multiplied to you many times over right now. A good example of that is our founding pastor, Ed and Lori. Ed was a father figure to Andre in ways that Andre has not experienced. He has a father, did not play an active role in his life. And when Andre got married and had children, he didn't know what that looked like. And Ed fulfilled that role. Not only that role, many roles. Ed fulfilled a role of helping Andre make good business decisions. Ed fulfilled a role in helping to disciple and lead him down a spiritual path, helped him to discover his gift. Lori, although I grew up in a Christian home, Lori filled a role that was different in my life. Um, when I met Lori, I was very insecure in who I was. I was very reserved in my faith. I studied. I studied the same way I studied now, but I kept it to myself. I prayed privately. You would never catch me praying in public. And so Lori fulfilled a part that I didn't have. Um, I love being at home, but I couldn't stand decorating a home. I thought it was just too much chaos, stuff that was out. Lori taught me about hospitality and why it was important to keep my home a welcoming environment. The first time I went to her house, I was like, you got too much stuff out. And, um, but you know, what, what I learned about that was um, when, when they were both really sick and coming home from the hospital, I went to their house because it was Blake's prom, the first surgery that your dad had, or the surgery your dad had, which was when Lori found out she had cancer. Think about that. They went to California to get surgery for Ed to find out Lori had cancer while they, while they were there. So my sister and I drove out there, and we were headed back because pro Blake was having prom, and we drove back. And um, when I walked through the house, I saw all these pictures all over the wall that I thought was clutter originally. But after she helped me understand the importance of making my house a home, and I saw all those pictures of the kids, I thought to myself, the kids and just their family, that even in their situation, they have made their house a home. And no matter what happens, there are memories that are established here which helped me see the value of making our home our home. So she filled roles that I didn't have, even though I grew up with my both parents in the house, Lori filled roles that I didn't have. What you sacrifice for, God will give to you multiple times. Now when they passed away, that was a void inside our heart that I can't even describe. And because they filled so many roles in our life that we didn't have, those are some big shoes to fill for a future mentor. And God has not brought us a single couple that can fulfill all those things. But over the last five years, God has brought us multiple couples that fill different roles. I'm talking couples from Canada, couples from Arizona, some that are here, some that are in California. God has sent us, and we're, we're there like, why can't you just send us a couple that lives in Las Vegas? But he has sent us couples around the world to be in relationship with us, to fill each of those different areas that we lost. You don't lose anything when God is in control. Whatever you've lost Hold on to the fact that he is going to multiply it many times more, more than what you think four plus four is. Now, there's a familiar story in the Bible that we all know, and actually, I think somebody already mentioned it, when, um, when Jesus fed the multitudes. 
But this morning, considering what we're talking about, I want you to look at this and I'm going to point out the multiplication to you in a way that you probably have not seen because that's just like our God. Amen? Amen? We've all heard the story, right? Okay. The fish and the loaves of bread. Let's turn to Luke 9. I'm going to start with verse 10. What, whatever you think about this passage, just don't think about that. Just we're going to read this and be open to something new. When the apostles returned, they told Jesus everything they had done. Then he slipped quietly away with them towards the town of uh, Beth. Beth, there you go. See, we're all in this together. But the crowds found out where he was going and they followed him. He welcomed them and taught them about the kingdom of God and he healed those who were sick. Late in the afternoon, 12 disciples came up to him and said, send the crowds away to a nearby village and farm so they can find food and lodging for the night. There is nothing to eat in this remote place. But Jesus said, you feed them. Okay, teachable moment for leaders. When something needs to be done, where do you normally go? Mm. To the top. You know, what did Jesus say? <laughs> go take care of it. <laughs> oh, we get that so many times. We should do this. You want to lead it? Hey, new ministry. I love that Jesus said, go feed them. See, too many times we're going to people to solve something when we need to be looking at how can I solve this? If we did more solving thought process than complaining, we'd have less complaining. Everyone wants to complain, but nobody wants to come with the solution. What is the solution? We don't mind you bringing something to us. Bring something to us with a solution in mind. Because the first thing we're going to say is, is this something you want to do? All right. That was a little teachable moment. Let's continue verse 13. But we have only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Are you expecting us to go and buy enough food for this crowd? That's kind of bold to be saying to Jesus. <laughs> what are you expecting us to do? There are, over, there are about 5,000 men. Then Jesus replied, tell them to sit down in groups of about 50. So all the people sat down. Tell them to sit down in groups of 50. You know what I love about that? Jesus was taking an assessment of what he had. It cracks me up when I ask people, have you balanced your checkbook? <laughs> have you balanced your bank account? Why I don't have any money? Well, you ain't with that attitude. You got to know what you got. You got to know what you need. <laughs> Jesus, he, they said, there's 5,000 men, 5,000 men that is not counting women and children. Jesus said, put them in groups of 50. We need to set some order here, see what we got. Commentary says that Jesus took care that his banquet shall be conducted with order worthy of God who gives it. We serve a God that does things decently in order. So even though there's a bunch of chaos, it's important that we set the order before God. Another very important principle here, and I hope that you don't miss it, is that Jesus took the time to figure out what he need. If all powerful Jesus set order, shouldn't we? <laughs> the orderly manner also allowed the guests to not only count easily, but it made it easy for distribution. There has, you've got, so you figure there's 5,000 men, but then there's women and children. So the Bible is not clear on the specific number of people, but you've all these people who need something and you've only got a very little, how do you handle that? You have to establish some form of order. Verse 16, now just tell you, we personally and as a church, we balance all of our bank accounts to the penny every month, every single month. I've been doing it for 11 years for this church, every single month to the penny. Why? We gotta know what we have, we know what we need, and our prayers are very effective. Because it's not, Lord, I hope you give, no. This is what we need. This is what needs to be done for our people. You got to know what you have. Verse 16, Jesus took the five loaves and two fish, looked up towards the heaven and blessed them. Then breaking the loaves into pieces, he kept giving the bread and fish to the disciples so they could distribute it to the people. Notice what Jesus did. 
He told them to set order and go divide up the people, right? He didn't complain about what he didn't have. He set order and said, okay, divide up the people, put them in groups of 50. He looked toward the heavens and blessed what he had. When you're looking at your bills and they don't equal what's in your bank account, are you looking to heaven to say, thank you, Lord, for the bread that you have provided and start working on them bills? Commentary says the blessing of Christ will make a little go great. It went on to say that in our father's house, there is bread enough and to spare. The reason they collected what was left over was because it was customary at the time for them to take what was left over and give it to the people of the poor in the other villages, which means God, Jesus said order. He knew what he had and he didn't waste anything. That's good stewardship right there. Bless what you have, be thankful for what you have, set some order, and be good stewards. Don't waste anything. What you're throwing away, somebody is starving and praying for. Now, it would have normally have taken 200 days of an average person's wages, which was seven months of hard labor to feed that crowd. What we do today, sitting behind a computer, is not hard labor. For them, during those times, it was hard labor, and it would have took seven months of labor to pay for what they fed that crowd. Just think about that. So God multiplied what seemingly didn't look like enough. The multiplication of food of this incidence is reminiscent of what God did with manna, with the Israelites. You guys remember that story? Okay. Well, think about this. When Jesus blessed the food, what did he do after he blessed it? He broke it. Sometimes the only way to heal something is to break it. Think about our bodies. Pastor Lori taught me this. When your body's aching and it hurts, that's your sign to let you know something's broken. Praise God for pain is good because without pain, we don't know we're experiencing something in our body. We don't know what needs to be tended to. Sometimes something has to be broken down to the smallest denominator so it can be healed. That's because healthy things grow. Healthy things grow. I'm overdue for a haircut, right, Mr. Victor? <laughs> he be telling me, mm, them ends. So my ends, are split ends, dead ends, and the only way my hair is gonna grow is if Mr. Victor cuts off the dead part so that the healthy hair can grow. Uh, Mr. Victor cut my hair a couple months ago, that's why he's looking at me crazy, um, and he said, I can't believe how much your hair has grown, but we've gotta, we gotta cut those dead ends. Sometimes things need to be broken. So what did Jesus do? He took what he had. He didn't complain. He set order. He blessed it. Then he broke it. And the next thing he did that we read at the end of uh, verse 16, he gave it away. He blessed, he broke, and he gave the end of verse 16 said he kept giving the bread and fish to the disciples so they could distribute it to the people. He kept giving. He kept giving. He broke and kept giving. Verse 17 says they all ate as much as they wanted and afterwards the disciples picked up the 12 baskets of leftovers. Why? They didn't keep what they had. He broke and kept giving. He broke and kept giving. God is our source for multiplication. What he gives us must be given away. And when we give it away, that begins the multiplication process. We won't have what we need. We will have more than enough because that is who our God is. And God did something similar to this in 2 Kings with Elisha. Now, whenever you want to understand a timeless teaching principle of the Bible, the principle you read would be the same in the Old Testament and the New Testament. It won't just be something that, if we see something that only occurred in the Old Testament, that would be something that is a cultural 
teaching. But when we see that the same thing is happening throughout history of the Bible, both in the Old and the New Testament, this is a timeless teaching of who our God is. Follow me? Okay, so this, what we just read in Luke was what Jesus did. Yes? Okay, let's go back to the Old Testament and see what God did with Elisha in 2 Kings 4. Verse 42, it says, One day a man from that country <laughs> brought the man of God a sack of fresh grain and 20 loaves of barley bread from the first grain of the harvest. Elisha said, give it to the people so they can eat. What? His servant exclaimed. Feed a hundred people with only this? But Elisha repeated himself, give it to the people so they can eat. For this is what the Lord says. Everyone will eat and there will even be some left over. And when they gave it to the people, say gave. When they gave it to the people, there was plenty for all and some left over just as the Lord has promised. See, the servant not only doubted their own ability, he doubted that God was able to feed all these people with the very little that he had. The condition of our spiritual health is our response to situations. How you respond to a situation tells us the condition of your spiritual health. Let me remind you of our Bible confession. Today I make my Bible the final authority in my life so that in every circumstance I will bear good fruit. That means when life hits you hard, are you bearing fruit? You're not exempt from things happening, but the way you respond will show us your spiritual health. So I'm going to show you this graph that I made of what happens. Jesus led the example of putting us in a position for multiplication. Jesus showed us that when he blessed, God began to initiate the breaking. When he blessed what he had. You know why we bless our food? Father, we thank you for blessing us with food for our daily bread, putting food on our table. We ask that you remove all sickness and disease from it and we receive it with thanksgiving. Then Jesus broke. God started the multiplication process. Jesus gave. God provided more to sow. Remember the scripture in Luke. As Jesus was, get, he kept giving it to the disciples to distribute it to the people. He kept giving. As he kept giving, God kept providing. God kept providing. God kept providing. Because he kept giving. Because he kept giving. Follow me? Okay, Proverbs 11.24 says, Give freely and become more wealthy. Be stingy and lose everything. Say, I'm not stingy. I'm not stingy. That might be your confession. <laughs> your spouse and you know if you're really stingy. Amen. I can't express this enough. What you compromise to gain, you will eventually lose Ooh. if you hold on out of fear of not having enough. Unfortunately, we're creatures of habit. We have a tendency to hold on to stuff out of the fear of not having enough. We've seen this even with laundry love. Oh my goodness gracious. This location that we've been going to the past couple years, Come on. they've requested us. That's because our church is so good with loving on the people. But you know, the area where this laundromat is located, our people kind of have a tendency to, uh, and that's because of where, where, they're, where they're brought up, um, nothing's really given to them, and they don't have much. And when they get something, they hold on to it because they don't know if they're going to get it again. I remember the first time we went to this location, that is what happened. We had people stealing the machines, cutting in front of people, because their thing was, well, hey, if this is free, I'm going to get mine. And I remember Pastor Andre having to sit down and talk to one of them and say, we're here and we're going to take care of everybody. There's no reason to be stingy. There's no reason to be selfish and, and try to gank the other person's laundry. We're staying until you all get taken care of. And once he diffused that, then everybody was like, okay. But, you know, the thing is, is we have to recognize that's where people are. If you grow up in a place where you don't get nothing and finally someone's giving you something, they're, they're just going to get it. But we live in that fear when we don't trust and rely that God's going to give us what we need. But when you hold on to it, you won't have anything. And because we're creatures of habits, 
We've seen this with the Israelites in Exodus. You guys are following me so far? Okay, this is important because you know I'm going to end this with a bang because I got the whiteboard. So you follow me, okay. Exodus 16, verse 16. These are the Lord's instructions. Each household should gather as much as it needs. Pick up two quarts for each person in your tent. This is when God provided manna to the Israelites. 40 years, think about that. Could you imagine eating the same thing for 40 years? If you have a problem with leftovers, that's a problem. Okay, so he says, verse 17, so the people of Israel did as they were told. Some gathered a lot, some only a little. But when they measured it out, everyone had just enough. Those who gather a lot had nothing left over. Say nothing left over. And those who gathered only a little had enough. Say had enough. Each family had just what it needed. Then Moses told them, do not keep any of it until the morning. But some of them didn't listen, say didn't listen, didn't listen, and kept some till morning. But by then it was full of maggots and had a terrible smell. Moses was very angry. See, when we hold on to something, what we're telling God is, I don't trust that you're going to give me what I need tomorrow, so I'm going to hold on to this. Verse 21, after this, the people gathered the food morning by morning, each family according to its needs. And as the sun became hot, the flakes that had not picked up melted and disappear. On the sixth day, they gathered twice as much as usual, four quarts for each person instead of two. Then all the leaders of the community came and asked Moses for an explanation. See, here come these leaders all the time. If you a leader, lead. We need an explanation. First you tell us take one, now you tell us take two. He told them this is what the Lord commanded. Tomorrow will be a day of complete rest, a holy Sabbath day set apart for the Lord. So bake and boil as much as you want today and set aside what is left it for tomorrow. So sometimes God will tell you when to say for a drought coming up if you're listening for his voice. I, something as simple as um, when we honored all of the ministry volunteers, we were supposed to do it last week, but we decided by the leading of the Lord to do it the week before. Well, praise God we did because most of our volunteers weren't here last week. It would have been pointless to honor them when they weren't here. See, something as little as that, God will nudge you when you need to do something in advance or hold on to something. But in the meantime, if there's no nudging, you're supposed to just let it go. Let it go, let it go. Frozen. Okay. So uh, let's see, where are we at? Verse um, 27, right? Who was paying attention? Verse 27, 26, 25. Thank you, Miss Ellie. Moses said, eat this food today, for today is the Sabbath day dedicated to the Lord. There will be no food on the ground today. You may gather the food for six days, but the seventh day is the Sabbath, and there will be no food on the ground. Some people went out anyway, and they found no food. Probably the same people who didn't listen when he said, only take what you need. The Lord asked Moses, how long will these people refuse to obey my commandments and instructions? Now, you know, God probably already know that answer. He was being sarcastic. He already know. Verse 29, they must realize the Sabbath is the Lord's gift to you. If you haven't listened to that Sabbath message, I'd encourage you to listen to it. The Sabbath wasn't created just for us to worship God. God created the Sabbath to give us rest. Let's see, where am I at? That is why he gives you a two-day supply on the sixth day, so there will be enough for two days. On the Sabbath day, you must stay each day in your place. Do not go out and pick up food on the seventh day, so the people did not gather any food. God will provide more than you can provide for yourself. He will provide what you need for this day, which is why the scripture says, give us this day our daily bread. He will provide your daily bread. Don't feel like you have to ration the blessings God has given you. The scripture says the blessing of the Lord makes us rich and adds no sorrow. If his blessing is causing you sorrow, trust me, it's not him, it's you. What are you doing with your blessing? That's causing the sorrow. And I'm going to show you where most people miss it in 2 Corinthians 9. So we've seen 
God talk about multiplication in the Old Testament. We've seen Jesus, how multiplication actually happened in the New Testament. We showed how God multiplied in the New Testament as well as in the Old Testament. And now let's see where the onus falls. Sometimes it's not about can God, it's about us. Can we? Can we follow through with what God is saying? So let's take a look at 2 Corinthians 9, verse 6. And I'm going to read this in the Amplified, how we're doing. Remember this, he who sows sparingly and grudgingly will also reap sparingly and grudgingly. He who sows generously, that blessing will come to someone, will also reap generously with blessing. So I'm sure many of you have heard that if, you heard, if you've been in church for any length of time, given it shall be given to you. If you give a little, you'll get a little. If you give a lot, you'll get a lot. Yes? Y'all follow me? Okay. Verse 7, let each one give as he is made up in his own mind and purpose in his heart, not reluctantly, sorrowfully, or under convulsion. Let me tell you, under convulsion means somebody up here stoking you to give and you decide to give. That's not cheerfully, that's under convulsion. Somebody has stoked you to give. For God loves, takes pleasure in, prizes above other things, and is unwilling to abandon or do without a cheerful giver. God is unwilling to abandon a cheerful giver. The only way to be a cheerful giver is to prove yourself to be a cheerful giver. And if you are a cheerful giver, he is unwilling to abandon you. He's going to keep blessing you so you can keep giving. A cheerful doer or a cheerful giver is joyous and prompt to do it, whose heart is in their giving. Verse 8, God is able to make all grace, every favor, earthly blessing come to you in abundance so that you are always under all circumstance. There goes that all circumstance again. Your Bible confession did not come out of thin air, let me tell you. Always under all circumstances, whatever the need, be self-sufficient, possessing enough to require no aid or support and furnish in abundance for every good work and charitable donation. As it is written, the benevolent person scatters abroad. He gives to the poor. His deeds and justice and goodness and kindness and benevolence will go on and endure forever. And God, who provides seed to the sower... Bread for your eating will also multiply your resources for sowing and increase the fruits of your righteousness, which manifests itself. The word manifest means that if you claim to be righteous, you can't just claim to be righteous. We're going to see if you're righteous or not. So if you're righteous, that will manifest itself in active, say active, active. goodness, kindness, and charity. Charity is giving or love, active, meaning that's what you do. Not you were good today because worship was nice and I got filled with the Holy Ghost and then I stepped outside the doors and cussed you out. Active means this is what you do. This is who you are. God provides seed to the sower. Well, you only a sower if you sow. Not one time, every time. So if you're wondering why you ain't got, that's because you ain't gave. Verse 11, thus you will be enriched in all things and in every way so that you can be generous, your generosity as it is, and minister us will bring forth thanksgiving to God. Are you generous with your time? Are you generous with your money? Are you generous with helping others? Verse 12. For the service that the ministering of this fund renders does not only supply what is lacking to the saints, God's people, but is also overflows and many cries of faith, thanksgiving to God. Affordable Christmas is a great example. For the past few weeks, we have been talking to families, seeing if they qualify to be a participant. The people we have spoken to are overwhelmed with gratitude that we would offer something for them where they don't feel worthy. That this would be such a blessing to them at this time. Not just what you give in this house helps the needs of our people, but what you give in this house helps the needs of the people outside these walls. And that results in a thanksgiving to God. See, when we give, we give, God multiplies, but our giving results in worship to him. The people that we give to, they can't help but to worship God because we met a tangible need. 
Um, if, if I can get the whiteboard up here, that would be great because I want to show you, I want to show you, I'm going to end with showing you this example. Um, sometimes meeting a need isn't the need that you think they should have. Meeting the need is what is the need that they have? You know, I've received gifts that have become a burden. I remember somebody gave us a gift, a membership to something that we had to pay every month. I was like, how is this a blessing to me? <laughs> this just created a bill. Then I had to find a nice way to say no. That put me under a lot of pressure. <laughs> now, this is what I think you need. Now, a blessing is meeting a need that they have. So I want to show you what all this means and how this looks when it comes to God multiplying. Can you all see this? I'm going to try to, to write this. I, sometimes I just think that, you know, it's my teaching style, so go with it. Um, okay. So we're talking about multiplication. Yes? All right. So it starts with a seed, and then it's going to be multiplied by X. And we'll talk about X in a minute. And when it's multiplied by X, you will have more seed to sow. Okay, because I need the rest of the board for other space. Okay, so you start with a seed that gets multiplied that gives you more seed to sow. So what is the seed? What's your seed? Your seed will be your faith that is planted. And we'll talk about what that is in a second. And based on what you do with this faith that's planted, will be multiplied by a MF, and not the MF y'all thinking of. <laughs> we in God's house, so clear your mind. We know where all y'all thinking now. Okay, X is the multiplication factor. So what multiplication factor is your seed going to be multiplied? You see it? You follow me so far? Okay, so based on your multiplication factor, by what your faith, your seed you planted, will equal, we'll put a question mark, because it can be a little or it could be a lot. Now let's talk about your faith that's planted. This could be your relationship, time, or money. So if you put a little in your relationship, Let's say you don't put nothing in your relationship. Your multiplication factor is going to be zero. So your nothing times zero is what? Okay. You could put in, well, you know, this is 50-50. So I'm going to give you one and you get one. And you get one back. Now, some of you might be okay with this. But if you cool with four plus four, more power to you. But if I'm willing to give 100 in my relationship, because your relationship with God or each other is not 50-50, it's 100-100. So if I give 100 times my one, I'm going to get 100 back. You see how this works? If I decide that I'm going to give God 1,000, I'm going to give my time 1,000. Well, let's, let's talk about money because... Everybody's interested in money. I give you $10 and you spend all 10 on you. You ain't got nothing left to give to anybody. 10 times zero is what? Is what? Now who want that kind of blessing? And if this is the kind of blessing you've been given, that's because this is what you've been giving. The multiplication factor that God will put on your seed all determines on what you do with your harvest. When you grow a harvest, I found this out with my herbs. When you grow the herbs, when you grow a harvest, you have to harvest, you have to remove your harvest so that it continues to grow more. If you don't do anything with it, the plant actually dies. Remember the breaking? Jesus blessed, he broke and gave. If you don't give any of the harvest from this seed that you plant, okay, let's talk about our time, okay? If you're not giving, say you had an appointment today, and by the grace of God, that appointment got canceled. 
Well, God just multiplied your time. Now, what you going to do with that time? You going to waste it because you were playing video games, looking at social media, not doing nothing? Then you didn't gain anything. But if you took that time and said, you know what, let me go teach a couple people how to do something over here. Because by teaching them, they can take care of these things. Now my time is freed up and I can go do these other things over here. You needed $1,000. God gave you 2000 You took care of your need. Scripture says he gives you seed to sow, bread for your food, right? So let me take my, let me give my 200 tithes. Let me take care of my $1,000 need. Now I got $800. Lord, what do you want me to do with this $800? You know, every time we have a need, God is, we've seen this firsthand where God blesses us. Blesses us, we have a need. We give, we tithe, we give some more. We give the first 10 to God. We pay whatever need we have. Whatever's left, we still ask God, what do you want us to do with this? And then we never have anything afterwards because like as soon as it comes it's all gone but the next day we're blessed with something else and that process just keeps repeating itself your multiplication factor of what you get for more sowing depends on what you do with your harvest what are you putting into your relationship with God you don't see God have you been seeking God you looking for him but have you sought him as much time as you spend seeking him you will find him that many times over you don't have a lot of time, what seed are you planting with your time? Is your time going on good ground or are you spending your time on things that is a waste of time? What seed are you planting with your money? Jesus assessed what he had, assessed what he needed, blessed it, broke it, gave it away, and God kept giving. What are you doing with your money? How are you harvesting what God has given you. We sing a song, one of my favorite worship songs is the desert song. The last part of that song says, this is my prayer in the harvest. What's the harvest? When you get something, when you have something. And we all talk about when we're broke, but what happens when God just blesses you with the harvest? This is my prayer in the harvest. When favor and providence flow, I know I'm filled to be empty again the seed I receive, I will sow. Is that just a worship song or is that your prayer? The seed you receive, you will sow. Do you sow what God blesses you with? So I ask you, what in your life needs to be broken so that God can heal it? What needs to be broken? Remember Jesus blessed, he broke and he gave. If you're struggling, whether it's in a relationship, with your time, with your money, with your health, what needs to be broken? You know what? When our health fails, that's a, if you're paying attention, like, like God said uh, to Moses, when are these people going to listen? If your body keeps breaking down, when are you going to listen? There's something different you need to do to take care of your body. Something as simple as eating right could change a whole lot of things. What needs to be broken? Or I should say, what are the, the unhealthy things that need to be broken off so that the healthy things can start growing in your life? Who wants to be healthy? If you love this life, if you love this life and you like being here, you have to be healthy. You have to be. What needs to be broken so God can start the multiplication in your life. Why settle for crumbs when he wants to give you a banquet? Why settle for four plus four when he wants to give you four times four? Not just money. See, when we do the right thing, money comes when we do the right thing. I know it's 1130, but <laughs> y'all not gonna believe this. So this week, we get a comment on our blog that said, um, we wrote a blog post that says, what if I seriously can't afford to tithe? There's a lot of people out there who feel like they can't afford to tithe. They have too many bills. And you know our heart, so we wrote with love. And this, and this is our most popular blog every week. It's one of our top. Um, that blog itself probably has over 30 comments. Um, and we wrote it a few years ago. And somebody had the audacity to put a comment out there 
that of course we would tell people this because we're pastors and we're too lazy to get a job. Now I said to myself, self, I was hot. Pastor Andre was cool, but I was hot. I was like, lazy, we far from lazy. Do they know what we do? And woohoo! So, deleted that comment. But what that made me realize was, what did that make me realize? <laughs> what that made me realize was how quick we are to assume without knowing. And clearly they didn't know too much about us to make that comment. Because if they knew, if they only knew, we sacrifice and we work hard. We work hard. And God rewards us for working hard in other ways that have nothing to do with how hard we're working in one area. We've seen God bless us for serving so well here in a completely different area. We've seen God bless us here for things that we're doing in a, in a, in a different area. But God will multiply when you do something with what he's given you. Whatever that is, he'll multiply. We were out there yesterday for the A21 walk. Um, just last night before going to bed, um, we were watching TV for a few minutes and uh, this is the first time I'd ever seen this, but the, who, the founder of A21 was being interviewed on TBN and she was a missionary previously. And she explained that she was going to preach a message to another country and the Holy Spirit convicted her because somebody as she was traveling handed her a flyer about human trafficking. And the Holy Spirit convicted her that she felt like her job to go to this other country and preach this message that somebody needs to hear to save their life was more important than reaching out to this person right here who was having this young child that was being taken for sexual activities. And she realized that the Holy Spirit told her, you are no different than a Levite and a Pharisee. You think you're a Samaritan, but you're not because you think your preaching is most important. When the Samaritan came by and saw someone who had a need and took the time to take care of that need. Hence, she had started A21 to help um, with human trafficking. She talked about they have a three-year-old in their custody now who has a broken pelvis. A three-year-old. See, church is not just here church is out there. So when God multiplies your time, you so busy doing what's important to you that you miss the person right here. They have a campaign going, can you see me? Most of the time when these girls are taken, they're out in the open servicing clients where they could be saved if anybody's eyes were aware. That's what yesterday was about walking to build awareness to let people know. That's not a church thing. This is a God-loving compassion thing. What do you do when you see the people around you? Are you so focused on what you have going on that we miss the hurting people? The hurting people is why God sent Jesus. Not for us just to gather in a room and encourage one another. That's important because this is how we learned how to do what we do. But when we step outside of these walls, what are you doing with the harvest God has given you? He's giving you time. Yeah, he delayed your traffic. He delayed your plane. You're stuck in an airport. What are you doing with that time he just gave you? He supernaturally cleared a debt. What are you doing with that extra money? Is it all about you? Because the multiplication factor you're going to get all depends on what you do with that. We serve a God that is an and also God. He will meet your need and give you so that you have more than enough. But if you hold on to what you have out of fear, you will continue to stay in lack. So as you leave here today, think about, Lord, what in me needs to be broken so that I can be healed? So I can be healed for relationships, so I could be healed with my time, so I could be healed with my finances, so I can be, my relationship can be healed with my daughter, my son, my work. What needs to be broken, Lord? Break me to the core so that I can be built and strong again. Let's pray.